you made a very important point at the very beginning of introducing this topic of Dzogchen and the Great Perfection. And that is, it's universally stated throughout all the Dzogchen literature. I haven't read all of it, but I have a good, good sampling. It's ineffable. Pristine awareness, primordial, is ineffable, inconceivable, transcends word, transcends anything you can possibly think. And yet there are thousands upon thousands of pages written about it and thousands and thousands of hours of teachings, verbal teachings that are given. So what's up with that? And there's a very good answer to this. And that is there are two fundamental uses of language. And so let's imagine you want to, you want to know about Paris. Let's imagine you've never been to Paris. Or no, let's say you, you have been. How about the Gobi? You ever been to the Gobi? No. Gobi Desert? Okay, that's a better example then. So I've been there. I bet my wife is really quite an expert on Mongo Mongo Mongolian culture and Buddhism. And so she took me there years ago. And so if you'd like to know about the Gobi, then I can describe it to you. I've had a good sampling. And I can describe the color of the earth and how the mountains, the nature of the desert, how big it is and so forth. I could give you a very good description of what it's like um, just in words. And all the words I would say would be very meaningful to you and have, you'd have some idea. Okay, this guy's been to, been to the Gobi, he knows what it's like. And so that use of language is called descriptive. It's not the same thing in the Gobi, but now that I've described it, if you travel around the world, you might recognize it when you're there because of my description of it, you know? But I didn't give you a clue how to get there. I've been there, I describe it, but you have no idea how do you go from London to the Gobi. Well, you, had, you have no idea by my giving, using language descriptively, although I gave you an accurate description as much as words can do so. On the other hand, I could say, James, the Gobi is really, if, if you spent your whole life in England, and didn't know about the Sahara and the Mojave Desert and so forth and so on, I'd say, you know, the go the, and you just don't know about deserts, I'd say, James, there's just nothing based on England, Wales, or Scotland, or North Ireland that would give you any idea. And so I can't describe it to you. My, it's just outside of your scope. Never known anything, you know, like medieval English people. Didn't know anything about outside of England, you know. So there's just no way. It's a whole lot of seashore with a lot of sand. That's not going to really cut it. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't catch. But what I can do then is use language instrumentally. Say, James, if you'd like to know Gobi and you've never been outside of the, the United Kingdom, uh, here's what you do. And I give you directions. I give you directions. And then you follow all the directions and lo and behold, there you see the Gobi for yourself without my ever having described it. And so I would say that all of the thousands upon thousands of pages of written material and of teachings all instrumental because the Gobi can be described. I could say, you know, you've been to the seashore, you know, on the West Coast in Cornwall. Okay, imagine a whole lot of that. You know? um, so I could kind of give you some idea because it's, you know, clearly within the scope of language and, con and concepts. But pristine awareness by its very nature is inconceivable, ineffable, but all the teachings are instrumental. And they're all, to use a Buddhist, a Buddhist analogy, fingers pointing to the moon. So if you just stare at the finger and try to gaze at it and so you look at the finger, you'll never know what it's talking about. But if you follow the line of sight, then, then it will point you in the right direction. And that's why they're called pointing out instructions. They point to you something that is hidden in plain sight. Hidden in plain sight. But we're so caught up in our concepts, our beliefs, our language, and so forth, that we can't see what's right there evident. And you made a very important point, And that is, you know, in the found, foundational teachings of the Buddha, not self, not self, your body is not a self, mind is not a self, not self, empty of self. And it's true. I mean, it's good. And neuroscientists corroborate that there is, there's no neurocorrelate for the self, no neurocorrelate for mental consciousness for that matter. Um, and then in the Mahayana teachings, the perfection of wisdom teachings on emptiness, all phenomena are empty of inherent nature. They don't really exist by their own side, objectively or subjectively. Well, that's also true. And there's corroboration from, that, from quantum mechanics. And some very astute philosophers like Hilary Putnam, with his, you know, Har the late Hilary Putnam at Harvard for many years. Um, but if you have that one insight, as you just said, suggested, that one insight, you cut through and you're actually viewing reality, and that includes your body, your mind, the environment, other people, from that perspective, then you don't even need to say, of course, hey, James, your body is not you. Like, why would anybody think that from this perspective? Of course. And they say, hey, James, 
although phenomena appears from their own side, they're not really there. You say, yeah, of course. Just if you're in a lucid dream and you know this is a dream, you don't need to be told, hey, that those mountains over there, you know they're not really there. They don't exist. You say, I know it's a dream. I got, we don't need to linger there. Um, the emptiness of a, an individual self of a person or the emptiness of inherent nature of other phenomena because with that one insight you get a bounty that all flow spontaneously out of that so i think there are very good reasons why this is considered to be the pinnacle of buddhist thought and practice and very timely that it's really only within the last 50 years or so that this whole tradition of Dzogchen, which is really so deeply embedded in tibetan buddhism and before that you know, Buddhism in India with the Mahamudra tradition and so on. It's only within the last 50 years that this Dzogchen tradition may be starting with Evan Gwens' book, you know, Tibetan Book of the Great Liberation. I don't know that there's anything on Dzogchen in English before that. I don't think so. That it's coming, it's coming to not just Europe or America, but modern world, only in this phase of human history. This phase, this, this phase of human history. And the prophecies, and we can take them with a grain of salt or believe them, whatever, but the prophecies are that this Dzogchen, this whole matrix of theory and practice, will be most powerful when times are most degenerate. Most degenerate. And uh, I think I have some intuition why that may be the case. But the fact is, it just recently come on the world stage that it disappeared from India and never really took, it was in China and disappeared from China. There was really only one culture on the planet that preserved this tradition, and that was Tibet and its immediately adjacent countries like, like Bhutan, the northern India, Ladakh, and so on. So I think something's really afoot here, something of tremendous significance and very timely that highly trained scientists, and I know some of them, physicists, they really resonate. And these are not Buddhist, but they read about Dzogchen and they say, oh, there's something deep there. Can we learn more about this? So I think the, the best is yet to come because this type yeah. of research uh, together is just barely becoming, barely beginning now.